John and Jordan, really great to be connected with you remotely. And we've done films with each of you uh, on the channel. And I, I know from talking to you individually that you were both very interested in each other's thought. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first time that we've done something like this, brought to, uh, people together to explore kind of independently. I'm hoping that I'm going to be kind of almost redundant in this conversation, but I'm really excited to see what you guys want to explore together. And I'd love to start by just asking you what it is that you find interesting about each other's thought, and that maybe will sort of give us something to spark off for the rest of the conversation. I'm very interested, and I, uh, I've had a, a delightful conversation with Jordan uh, last week. Um, I'm very interested in a couple of connections. Uh, one that uh, comes first to mind is um, I've been exploring what I, I use this metaphor of the grammar, uh, the cultural cognitive grammar of the West and how it's related to the projects of wisdom and uh, uh, meaning in life. And I see that uh, Jordan um, seems to be talking in a way that's resonant with that. He talks about a code and about trying to get beyond the code and he extends towards um, uh, this state uh, that he uh, refers to by the term uh, uh, coherence. And I'm very intrigued by that and how that relates to some of the discussions um, I've had with others and some of the work I do on self-transcendence and insight. And I'm also interested in how that process uh, and how coherence I, 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 it's clear to me that it's not identical to, but it seems to be uh, very, I don't know, uh, again, convergent with the work I'm doing on relevance realization and some of the discussion about perspectival and participatory knowing. Um, and what's really, um, and, and, and I want this to be taken very seriously, very seriously. What's intriguing me about Jordan is he's not just talking about this. I see him, you know, exemplifying it in the way he interacts with the, each other. And I find that also uh, uh, deeply uh, thought provoking and interesting. Yeah, I was contemplating the question and, and what, what came up, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in the mountains of BC right now and apparently a bear just approached and the dogs decided that wasn't a good idea. Um, what came up for me and it made me laugh was the, the feeling of, uh, it seems like John is, is seeing or probably feeling the same elephant. This is the blind men. Um, I've spent a decent amount of the past couple of years becoming blind so that I am more able to reach out and use a different set of senses to try to perceive what's going on. And those senses indicate to me that John is doing something that is very real. Um, and the part of me that is still very much operating in the, as to call it, the domain of semantic cognition is able to connect the story that he's telling with things that I also uh, understand to be true. So there's a really nice combination there between a way of holding the story as a weaving of a narrative that has the, the characteristic of being what I would call maybe semantically true or scientifically true. Mm -hmm. um, and also is doing something at a more fundamental level that has that almost haptic feeling of, well, we have the word for it, the feeling of insight. So there we go. Mm -hmm. And also I just want to interject that there's a sense that we have as well on the channel that, that I think we both talked about before, or we talked about with each of you before, that there is a kind of evolving conversation. And I also have this sense that both of you are holding quite important pieces of that evolving conversation. Uh, I think so too. Um, one of the things that's, uh, and I keep saying this, but it's because it keeps impressing itself upon me. Uh, one of the things that has been a great gift of the video series is precisely uh, my sense of uh, connecting with groups of people that I think are putting real, real time and talent into uh, trying to uh, craft viable and you know long standing way like ways that will have long standing in their life uh, responses to what I term the meaning crisis and trying to uh, uh, and trying to 
the, the words sort of inadequate, but they're, they're trying to create something that, that I see as simultaneously salvaging from the past, but having some genuine novelty and creativity in it. There's something in it that people are working towards. Um, and, is, and it's interesting because there's a sense, there's a simultaneously for me, a sense of play in what people are doing. It, and I mean that in serious play, the way children really play when they're really learning. Uh, but there's also, it's mixed with a sense of urgency precisely because of a, a lot of the situations we face in the world. Um, and so I used to be sort of more pessimistic about things, but as I started meeting uh, people, um, and people like Jordan, for example, and, and communities, um, it, it's been shifting uh, in my mind uh, to a more hopeful stance. Um, so that's been a great, a great gift for me. Would you say you're hopeful, Jordan? Hmm. I would say I'm full of hope. I don't know if anybody else noticed, but um, if you really reflect on the last um, bit of time when John was speaking, there were a number of notes that came up that are very much to the center of the, what I would call maybe in the essence of the conversation. I don't mm -hmm. know if, for example, there was a point where he was endeavoring to say something that was difficult, and he even specifically spoke to the fact that the words were hard. And I actually was able to feel the energy of playfulness and the energy of urgency in the way he was bringing himself to the thing he was trying to say. And I think that's so much to the heart of the matter of the, the being there and the being out there and mm. the feeling of really being fully exposed. And I guess the metaphor we used in our last call was playing jazz, but it's almost yeah, yeah. weaving jazz. It's discovering jazz in this, in, in the moment of also playing it. Um, and recognizing that you're playing jazz for all the marbles. And uh, so it's more even than hope than it is, I would say, courage. And the courage that comes from actually noticing that as you're standing there, there are other people who are also standing there with courage. That's maybe a better way of framing it. Maybe playing jazz on a, while walking on a tightrope. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Jordan had a, uh, well, there's two things I want to say about that. The, the first is it reminds me um, of uh, the notion, the ancient uh, uh, Israelite notion of da'af, of sensing that you're participating in a course and, right, and you're involved in that. And so, uh, and that was an older meaning of faith as opposed to the more modern meaning of sort of willful assertion without rational evidence or some such thing. But the, 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 this older meaning was the sense of, you know, this participatory knowing of something, right, that you're deeply involved in, but has a, a greater life than you, and, and it has some course, and, you, and you're both sensing that course, but you're also being surprised by it as it's unfolding, and uh, that's very much become um, more, more, more salient to me, and the, the other thing I want to say relates to this, because Jordan had this wonderful metaphor uh, last time um, uh, that I believe he got from sort of communication science about the way you can sort of load uh, lots of messages into one signal. And I found that particularly perspicacious about trying to articulate this sense of sort of a multi-dimensional kind of participatory communication uh, that was going on. And then I, I, I wonder, Jordan, if you could bring that up again, because I, I found that very sort of um, helpful last time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, and I guess suppose, since we're using the metaphor of, of uh, tightrope uh, acro yoga, um, <laughs> I feel called to try to do it in real time. So the thing that came to me as you were saying that was the phrase for those with ears to hear. Right. And yes. There's a way of being able to pluck the string of communication that recognizes the way that all the different um, modes of communication are um, collected in a moment. So just then, for example, I was clearly saying a set of words that have a very simple semantic meaning. But if you happen to have some connection to the, um, the history or the mythology that those words happen to be associated with, I'm invoking a frame and maybe even a disposition that allows a way of communication that is uh, deeper and richer. Um, that's just one example. And the point mm -hmm. is that you can do that in many, many different modes simultaneously. So tone of voice and pace of speech and um, the jumping back and forth between different frames to be able to create a very high order communications fabric through which larger and larger and deeper and deeper and therefore, at least in principle, more meaningful communication can happen in 
which is ostensibly the same amount of objective time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I find that very interesting because I, I find this idea of, if you'll allow me the metaphor, right? If we think of the, 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 the typical models of communication, like a channel and sort of horizontal between us, you're talking about this sort of more vertical aspect, right? We're trying to bring in all these layers, if I can use that metaphor. Uh, and, you know, and, and for me, that bespeaks something that I think is very, very important because when I talk about meaning and meaning in life, I, I repeatedly acknowledge this is a, where I'm using a semantic metaphor to try and convey something right, that's ultimately uh, deeper than the semantic communication. I talk about the perspectival knowing and the, and the participatory knowing. And, and so one way I've been trying to think about what we talked about last time is that you're trying to bring right, a kind of Sorry, I don't, want to, I don't want to misuse your word here, but the word that came to my mind was a kind of a coherence, a vertical coherence uh, between these different uh, modes of knowing, these different levels, um, so that rather than them being orthogonal or disjointed or disconnected, they are mutually informing and transforming each other. And then that's what's being conveyed uh, to the other person. I apologize. I just noticed that it's cold in Canada. I need to go inside. Uh, one of the things I talk about the series is the different ways in which people read text, for example, as an example, to start, try to start deepening the metaphor. So I compare how we read text. We read, we tend to read text, uh, right, in a consumatory fashion. We're taking in the propositions. We're looking for the in, sort of the logical coherence between the propositions in our head. And we're sort of living inside of our head in that way. And then before that, typified in oh. what people do in Lectio Divina, right, was this, this re reading that was recitation. It was done communally and, right, and it, it's meant to be participatory, the, like the way you, you read a poem or the way you, you sort of set yourself to appreciate music. And, and then the whole point of that was not just to take in uh, the information and consume it, but the idea was that you could actually only approach the reality that the words were referring to if you were allowed something other than just the semantic content to engage you in a transformative process, right? So it was very much this um, idea that you can't, there, there, these deeper realities require a transformation before we can appropriately uh, grasp, you know, the meaning of the words that are being uttered. And so, the, 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 and so Kranz and others talk about, you know, the notion of the self was a much more extensive notion. It was involved with others and with the text rather than being sort of locked inside the head and locked inside the propositions. Now, why all of this is relevant to me and I think to our conversation is because, right, one of the core aspects of what people reliably seem to be pointing towards when they're seeking meaning is this sense of a deep connectedness connectedness to themselves, to each other, and to a reality that in some sense is, is greater than them. And it's interesting because I think, I, I, well, this is what it seems to me, I think you're doing something very analogous with spoken discourse as what people were, trying, were doing with the, the reading, which was also being spoken, by the way. What I mean by that is you're trying to bring back, right, the connectedness of the communication process right, that has tended to be neglected, backgrounded, and perhaps even forgotten about, right, as we have foregrounded this idea of getting, you know, the propositional content. And so I feel like when I'm talking to you, the propositional content is in service of this other, like, I feel you really trying to, like, create channels of, uh, of connection, right, where we're mutually transforming each other, that's going beyond just exchanging the propositions. Whew, yeah. Um, Sorry, that was a lot, but I was trying to put together. That was great. <laughs> that was not a, that was not a uh, frustration. That was a, a uh, you know, we're, we're doing the thing. Um, what well, one thing that, that was coming up almost like a, what is it, the angel on the shoulder? You're right. Is the, the feeling, I remember when I was younger, I, I noticed that I had a really hard time with music. Hmm. Um, and I was wondering why that would be the case. And then I realized that it's because most music that we encounter in our lives these days is irresponsible. Um, music has a very strong capacity to modify the emotions. In fact, to modify the body. Right? So if mm -hmm. you're listening to music, you cannot help but have some meaningful change in your 
physical uh, state. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very powerful thing and mm -hmm. needs to be held with a very high degree of, of ethics. I would even say it to be at the level of, of the sacred. And I was feeling that because as you were talking about the notion of, of connectedness and the notion of to be transformed mm -hmm. in the act of communication, Yes, there's, there's, a, there's something that happens in any form of communication that has the ability, at least in principle, to take advantage of this wholeness of possibility and to participate in that wholeness of possibility, to, to be speaking in a way that is simultaneously poetry and prose and music and dance and mm. allow all of those different modalities of expression to convey something that is I suppose, deeper. And as you say, this starts to move much more in the direction of meaningfulness. Like there's something mm -hmm. connecting meaningfulness and wholeness. Um, in fact, now that I'm thinking about it, you spoke to the fact that, I think it was episode 18 or 17, of the, um, uh, the Plotinus and then later Augustinian weaving together of yes. the three yeah. distinct threads. Yeah. And I think that's very much to the point that mm. there's a, when we are interacting with each other to be able to heal each other in the moment and to be able to bring each other more fully present to what is happening in the moment and then to be able to do something that gives rise to something that is greater than the sum of its parts to have a, a synergy oh, yeah. in yeah. the moment and I, I your invocation of both augustine and plotinus i think is very apropos because i mean that's the i think that goes back to the core platonic insight right the, uh, and that's the that's for me one of the crucial decisions we made in the west we, we we stopped the platonic dialogue and went into the aristotelian treatise right and the platonic dialogue i mean at times they're very mm. ham-fisted i get that but there are also moments where you can where you can see plato trying to catch what was happening right in the in the socratic Olympus and the platonic dialogue like what you just said that the two of us together can co-create something that transcends both of us and, and, but I wanted to, uh, and I wanted to pick up on a platonic metaphor that you also mentioned, and I didn't want to lose from what we were talking about, because it wasn't only the idea that, you know, you and I are engaging in this mutual transformation. It's the idea that that transformation is required for us to enter into, right, a relationship with aspects and dimensions of reality. See, when, 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 we, when we did the sort of divorce that, you know, I don't have to go through transformation in order to get access to deeper aspects of reality. I just, just think clearly about it. I, I think that was also something that we've lost. The, uh, so I think what I'm trying to articulate, and I, I, it feels like it's resonant with what you're trying to articulate is, no, 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 right? Not only do, do we have to get into a particular mode of transformational you know, connectedness in order to you know, reach each other and resonate with each other. There are aspects of reality that are also only accessible if we are willing to, you know, undergo transformation in order to connect to them as well. And I think, I think that needs to be kept in the conversation as well. If there's ways to have uh, like a laser strobe lights just a few seconds ago, I would push that button. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to convey how how powerful it, it is to be able to perceive the meaningfulness of what you just pointed to. Mm. I'm trying, it's words are very, very not capable. Let's see. Oh God. <sighs> it's incredible. So, maybe as a very terrible metaphor, you can begin by talking about the, the capacity to achieve a certain level of coherence, mm -hmm. continuity of communication through propositions as having a flatness to it. It's a two-dimensional thing, mm -hmm. which ain't nothing. You know, we can make a really big piece of paper and it can go on, right? It can be infinite in all directions, but it's two-dimensional. And then there's another move that has this deepening, which adds a third dimension, which for a second I kind of felt like was the thing. But then I realized that as, as I really felt this proposition, this invitation to take transformation itself as being 
Ah, so there it is, got it. That's the whole point, got it, neat. It is, in through, it is through being transformed that we are no longer merely perceiving reality, but are actually one with it. Mm. And yeah. this is the key to the whole move. If you think about there being a, a very strong distinction between a sort of analytic approach where we endeavor to be the observer outside that which is observed and some other new thing, which for just analytic reasons, I'll refer to as a synthetic approach. Mm -hmm. The analytic approach has limitations as we've run up to over and over again over the last two centuries in the West. Um, to the degree to which you are by definition part of a system your observation of that system cannot help but modify the system and therefore your capacity to perceive what is is intrinsically filled with blind spots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you actually proceed by a method of allowing yourself to be fully transformed in your engagement with what's happening then you are actually one with the system you are not perceiving as an observer distant from it you're emersonian the emersonian transparent eyeball yeah and this is a very different way of knowing. It's a way of yeah. knowing that has the capacity to actually be perceiving wholeness, to be perceiving complexity and not merely the complicated. Hmm. I, I, I would say that I often try to point towards that kind of knowing when I talk about the participatory knowing, the knowing that we know by not just, you know, getting a proposition or having a skill applied or even having a, you know, a salience landscape to wrap around it, but we only can know something by, by allowing ourselves to be transformed in a coupled relationship to it. We, we couple ourselves to it and allow ourselves to be transformed. And in the, in the way our, tra in the transformation of our own self-knowledge, we are simultaneously getting the knowledge of the other thing. And that's that deep sense of oneness. I think you're trying to articulate, right? It, I, it's, it's, I am, it's how I, how I, like when I'm talking to you, I feel aspects of myself coming up, right? Things are, are coming up. And that's part of how I'm knowing myself differently right here, right now. And that that's, that's giving me an insight into and a connectedness to how I think, right, you are here right now. And that's what, that's what I typically try to point to when I point to uh, participatory knowing and, and the fact that we have pushed, I mean, this is not an idea uh, original to me by any means. I mean, I think a lot of important people, Marlo Ponti and others, were trying to remind us how foundational um, this kind of knowing is, and, and that all the other knowings depend on it. But we have tended, for various historical and cultural reasons, to neglect it and seriously background it. And 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 the, and I want to say something more. And 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 this is this is not meant to be flattery. It's meant to be a genuine compliment. You see, if if that is important to you, and this is what I mean when I say to people, don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you practice. Right? You you have to practice participatory knowing, and that's what mm -hmm. I see. That's what I see you doing, and that's what I see you constantly trying to articulate with people. It's like, no, no, you, like, we can't just talk about this. You have, like, <laughs> it's like, it's like an anthropologist saying, you know, you got to go and do participant observation in the culture, or you'll never get the culture. You'll never get it. You can talk about it, you can reflect on it, but you've got to go there. You have to be transformed by the culture and know yourself differently. And that's how you come to know the culture. And that's why I mean, it's so important that, that right, that there is this, I don't want to make it sound like you're you're stubborn because that's not what I'm trying to convey. That that would be to mislead. What I'm trying to say is there's there is this way in which you keep right, gently trying to bring people back right to this communication is something that has to be practiced. Right, it it is a practice. It is it is not just a set of statements or a claim or a theory. And and I and I I I find that so so central and important. It's easy to say, but it giving it the priority is just really, really important. Yeah. Um, I think maybe now might be a, a window or an opening to maybe why, mm -hmm. uh, why yes. that would be the case. And in your, in your series, you, you refer to the meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. And I imagine given who you are, you're not using the word crisis lightly. No. Um, yeah, you're not saying the, the sort of somewhat disturbing meaning thing. No, no, you're saying the meaning crisis. Yes. And 
I, I think, of course, feel very much the same thing. So what I would say is that in my particular journey to come here, um, which gives rise to what I would say is the commitment that I think that you're perceiving in terms of stubbornness. That's the word I want. Um, I endeavored to explore every possible route that was not this route um, to address that crisis. Mm -hmm. I perceived the crisis too clearly. Every time that I looked at any aspect of life, and this is very much in the objective domain. And so whether I looked at financial markets or I looked at nuclear proliferation or I looked at concentration of uh, uh, hormones in the water supply or fill in the blank, what I noticed was that the, the thing that we are participating in, the mode of civilization, the mode of doing that we actively engage in together um, seems to be accelerating towards some point of criticality, mm -hmm. um, a crisis, a true crisis in the Bronze Age sense. Yes. And my life left me with a certain capacity to think clearly, meaning to take things slowly and be able to notice when something was logically sound and when the evidence was what it was. And so as I found myself holding more and more and more examples of evidence of the fact that this was the case, I found myself compelled to step into trying to address it. And this then led to the journey that leads us here, which is to say that the approach of proposition, the approach that apparently started in the West around 1050, um, won't address the problem. And it's really as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And you can't get there from here. Um, we can spend some time talking about why. We can spend time talking about how it fails for those who've been trying its uh, It'd be useful to notice why that's the case. But the, you know, the kind of the jumping to the end game won't work. It's uh, not the right tool. And so, okay, well then what? And then that leads to a, a turning inward and a turning into all of the stuff that you've been hitting just even in this conversation with um, what I feel is almost a brilliance. Um, bringing to a very narrow path a very narrow window, which is for us to make it as a species through the exterior aspects of the crisis that we find. We must, as individuals, first make it through the interior crisis of becoming transformed and to be allowing ourselves to be intimately and vulnerably transformed by the reality that is in fact simply there mm -hmm. um, and to be in relationship with it with nothing between us and it so that we can at long last respond to what is really happening and discover in ourselves that capacity to be responsive to what is really happening, which is such a funny thing. Like it's literally right there. Mm -hmm. It's right in front of us. It's at our, at our hands. Um, it's really a choice to, to be able to reach out and grab the response to the meaning crisis. Thank you. And that, that, was, uh, that was very, very clear. I got a very strong sense of like how you got here. Um, I'm glad that you um, articulate um, the seriousness of the, the use of the term crisis because um, I'm trying to convey with that term what you said, the deep need for deep transformation uh, and, and, and your code your, word, your, your use of the word code, my use of the word grammar, are, this is not a transformation in what we're saying, but more how we're saying and how we're living what we're saying. And, and, and we need to, and that, getting back to that is problematic for us precisely because of the way the code has unfolded uh, historically. Mm. And so that's part of the crisis. And then it, it, what I also am trying to convey is uh, the, the sense of threat, which you've already articulated, so I won't repeat that. I'm also trying to articulate the pervasiveness of the suffering, the loss of agency, the distress, you know, that people are experiencing, uh, you, you know, suicide rates going up, loneliness, uh, all of these. And you, if, you, if, you, if, you re, if you look into these discourses that people are talking about, it, they're often implicitly or, and sometimes explicitly converging on, you know, it's the loss of connectedness that is, you know, that's sort of the core thing. 
And so I'm trying to get also the pervasiveness of the suffering and the distress. And then lastly, and I think you were, you were uh, 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 hinting towards this, the degree to which the meaning crisis um, causes a mental fog, if I, if I can put it that way. It, it, it makes us very incapable of responding uh, to the other serious issues uh, that are urgent and, and facing us right now. And I think that has to go towards a kind of, a sort of a psychological model um, that, um, you know, a scarcity mentality. When and we, the research right. shows that when people are in scarcity for time or food, they become inflexible in their cognition, their capacity for insight goes down, uh, they tend to become very um, conservative uh, uh, and ossifying of their worldview, right? There's all these things that come in with a scarcity uh, mentality. And I think when people are facing a scarcity of meaning mentality, it's also having this very compre the, the, because meaning is so comprehensive in our cognition, the scarcity mentality is so becomes so pervasive in our cognition. Our 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 lack of flexibility, our incapacity for insight, our 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 our, our sense of the, in, the 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 transformation is not sensed as being viable for us. I think this is also what I'm trying to articulate with the word crisis. That the meaning crisis causes this fog and this ossification in our cognition that right prevents us from responding to the a lot of the threats. So I'm trying to convey all four of those dimensions with the word crisis, and and that is exactly why I, I use that term. I do get some uh, flack from it from people, uh, but. I, I, that is exactly why I use the term that way. And I, I, I'm glad that you, you have sort of picked up on that. I just wanted to sort of deepen that because it, it means that the project that, you know, that you're engaged in and I'm engaged in and then when we're engaged in it together is really maybe, I mean, you have to worry about being self-promotional, right? But I, I think it really is the central project of our time, right? It is the thing we have to most do right now. Well, I think it's um, something that we can't, can say without having to worry about being self-promotional is mm -hmm. that, uh, for me at least, I believe that to be the case enough that I am in fact fully committed. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean in, in, in sort of the burning of the boats metaphor, mm -hmm. the all-in metaphor, um, there's, I've left nothing in other there's no portfolio theory for me. This is a, a very specific, focused, this is it. This is what must happen. And I will step into that fully. And mm -hmm. so obviously I could be some variation between error and um, insane, um, but at least I can say that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a clarity uh anyone who's perceiving and i and i, I notice that this is also uh, even endearing that when one watches what you're doing in your series that this is also felt um you're in mm -hmm. uh, you're doing it you are fully in you're doing what you can with as much artistry and commitment in it as you can to do the thing that you find to be most meaningful um, yes I wanted to <clears throat> respond a little bit to this, the weaving of, of crisis and maybe make it more, pardon me, <clears throat> maybe make it a little bit more first person or more um, personal. Sure. Because there's a, something very fundamental about how crisis works, particularly in humans where, and the scarcity piece is important. It's like scarcity begets separateness mm -hmm. and separateness begets carelessness as opposed to carefulness and carelessness begets scarcity where right, right. as I feel a certain level of let's begin with scarcity in myself perhaps I have a an interior experience of hardening perhaps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or of reactivity where something happens, you know, I'm uh, driving and somebody cuts me off. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So my interior experience then, if it, if it brings me out of my sovereignty, to use the term that I've been using, um, can then lead to me pouring that interior noise back out into my exterior. 
I, I get home and I yell at my kid. Right. So there's a movement between externalizing noise, externalizing separateness, externalizing that which is entropy, to use the physics concept, having an impact on the interior, which then creates a movement in the directionality of how does one respond to a, a feeling of lack, a feeling of separateness, a feeling of scarcity, which then has a characteristic of becoming less careful, less caring, less precise, and pouring that back out. And it's kind of like a broken windows theory of the objective and the subjective and the individual and the plural in relationship with each other that can begin to generate the feedback loop that ultimately corrodes the fabric of meaning and it corrodes the fabric of meaning both in the outside in what we would call society or how we know how we can actually participate with each other as humans and not as primates which is kind of the point of civilization mm -hmm. um, and corrodes the fabric of meaning on the interior which is how we can be humans in relationship with each other and with the world um, and we become less and less human, we become less and less uh, reasonable, less and less uh, thoughtful, less and less uh, kind, less and less uh, rational for that matter. Mm -hmm. More and more of what we're doing is a, a defense mechanism and a strategy of just achieving local um, victories and power plays. And you know, if you kind of just continue to walk down that path, we've, David and I, I think, have talked about what happens in discourse when this shows up in the distinction that I made between thinking and simulated thinking. When you strip mine and abuse the fabric that is so carefully woven through thousands of years of our capacity to actually engage in thinking together uh, into this other thing, simulated thinking that has a, a re re rhetoric uh, as its characteristic, um, where it's a combat and- All Right, adversarial. Adversarial, right, oh, right, right. rivalrous. It is yeah. win-lose. Um, and, and more and more, right? So I just kind of wanted to point towards that can of worms and all the other stuff that's sitting around that territory to maybe help ground this notion of, of how meaningfulness, what the, what the meaning of meaningfulness is. Mm -hmm. and how there's something to the soil of that that is, requires a, taking it slowly and really embodying the sense of it to grasp what it means again for there to be a crisis and how crisis is actually very simple. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an individual is undergoing a crisis quite often can choose death over the suffering of the crisis. Yes. Okay. So too can a civilization. So I thought that um, I would, I would like you to, uh, to talk a little bit more about that distinction uh, between real thinking, I think you said, and simulated thinking. Um, I, I, that really, that really sort of resonated with me. Um, as you know, I'm interested very much in, you know, the, how people can engage in self-deception, how they can bullshit themselves. And mm. I'm, wa I'm wondering what the relationship is between something like simulated thinking and, you know, bullshitting yourself, things like that. And, and could you speak to that, please? Because I'm trying, I'm, I, I feel like they can be connected in a, in a helpful way. Yes. And, and I just noticed that we're just about out of time. Okay. Um, so maybe what happens is we have this conversation another time. I would like that. Because um, I don't think we can deal with it deeply, but that, that would be wonderful. I'd love, I'd love to do that. I feel like this is just a, this is not a one-off conversation for the purposes of creating an artifact for YouTube. <laughs> this is a collaboration. That we <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. To choose to allow to be recorded. Right, um, right. So uh, let's schedule seven other, or another call. Uh, to have that conversation. I, I, I'm fully in on that. I would love that. I would just want to say thank you guys for making the time for this and for letting us uh, have a window into the conversation that you, you've you started with each other. And I think it's been a really fascinating discussion. And I look forward to seeing where this conversation evolves to next. If you enjoyed this, we have an amazing two and a half hour emergent conversation, making sense of sense making between Jordan Hall, Jamie Wheel and Daniel Schmachtenberger available for subscribers in the members area of our website. <laughs>